For centuries, seers and prophets have come forward, offering dramatic visions of mankind's destiny. But what happens when the predictions turn deadly? Marie Julie suffered numerous physical assaults from the devil, which occurred right at the time she first received the stigmata. Our Lady warned her repeatedly to expect his attacks. The devil would beat Marie Julie to where she was covered in bruises and lesions, but they never became infected and healed quickly with an application of holy water. The demon would cause religious pictures to fall off the walls, throw her crucifix to the floor, or shake her religious relics to the ground. He would break her rosaries, steal her precious religious objects, rip up her humble straw mattress, and if people were witness to the event on some occasions, he would knock them to the ground as well. During that period of suffering, she was granted the grace to perceive this world from a different perspective. She saw and foresaw many things, and it is those very predictions that are now beginning to unfold, shocking everyone who learns about them. A terrifying thing is happening to France. A hundred years ago, Marie-Julie Jehenny foretold that France would offend God, leading to apocalyptic disasters. Marie-Julie Jehenny mentioned France in her prophecies. France will be the starting point for the worldwide chastisements, as France was Catholic before other nations and was granted more graces than other countries. France has been given the mission to defend the Church and the true faith through times of persecution and heresy. Because of its failures and its rejection of its heaven-blessed monarchy, it would be struck first, but then the punishments would spread throughout the world. Paris will burn and Marseille will be engulfed. Several cities will be shaken down and swallowed up by earthquakes. People will believe that all is lost. Nothing will be seen but murder. Nothing will be heard but the clash of arms and blasphemy. There must be an end to evil. If we put it off again, all souls would be lost. That is, if he did not cleanse the earth of hardened sinners, evil would grow so much on earth that eventually all the just souls would weaken and also fall into sin. It is necessary that my holy church triumphs. Some might wonder why the punishment would first come to France. Those who followed the opening ceremony of the Paris 2024 Olympics might find an explanation. The ceremony featured numerous anti-God elements, including a segment where a scantily clad queen and a naked singer reenacted scenes from Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting, The Last Supper. Additionally, the closing ceremony featured a headless goddess with broken wings. All these acts were blatant offenses against God before the eyes of the entire world. So, what punishments will God deliver? In her prophecies on September 20th, 1877 and January 4th, 1884, Marie spoke of unprecedented earthquakes, hurricanes, crop failures, rapidly spreading plagues, and a rain of blood lasting seven weeks. The world would endure three days of darkness. While Marie did not specify how long these events would last, she indicated that the punishments would be global and unceasing, leaving the earth desolate, with three quarters of the population perishing and half of France's population being wiped out. People will be scarcer than smoke is not just a figure of speech. One will have to travel far to encounter another person. Although these catastrophic prophecies sound terrifying, the seers also indicated that this would not be the end of the world, and humanity still has hope. Our Lord showed Marie how certain leaders of France, who seemed perfect heroes in the eyes of the world, were traitors to their country and to the Church. For instance, Christ said of Charles de Gaulle, His lies and his conceit do not deceive me. Of interest, the Marquis de la Franquerie has this to say about our Lord's comment to Marie Julie on General Charles de Gaulle. According to our Lord, as revealed and compared with the other prophecies of Marie Julie, de Gaulle was a criminal to his country as he upheld the Masonic ideals of the Republic, rejecting the absolute monarchy of France. This prophecy, dated August 10, 1880, foretells a time of severe persecution for the Church in France and the Vatican, described as a form of spiritual and physical suffering. 
the prophecy suggests that an important figure referred to as the prisoner martyr or the angelic pontiff will call out for help from his supporters but it will be dangerous even punishable by death for anyone in the kingdom to respond to his call the prophecy likens this future suffering to a second passion not for christ himself as his passion was singular but for those who represent him on earth specifically the church's leaders such as cardinals and bishops these leaders will undergo a type of passion as they are persecuted shackled like prisoners and face a fierce pursuit by hostile forces the prophecy also predicts that the church will be attacked from within and without its leaders will be driven from their positions of authority and forced to flee churches and sacred spaces will be deserted with ministers being forcibly removed hell's influence in the form of evil men will ascend to power taking the place of the true servants of God at the altars. These usurpers will desecrate the church's ceremonies and pervert its teachings, especially corrupting children, which the law will compel parents to allow. This period of sacrilege and persecution will last for 44 days, during which many Christians will be martyred. However, the prophecy also holds a promise of divine retribution, the crimes committed during this time will swiftly be met with the vengeance of the Lord. This prediction warns of a catastrophic attack on the church, but also points to a forthcoming divine justice against those who seek to destroy it. The imagery of the church's leaders suffering a passion, the desecration of sacred spaces, and the corruption of children suggests an unprecedented assault on the core of the faith. It serves as both a forewarning of persecution and a call to faithfulness in the face of trials. Throughout the prophecies, Marie Julie continually announced, Our Lord and Our Lady were preparing the coming of the great monarch and angelic pontiff, which many saints and mystics had announced centuries before her. Saint Michael promised Marie Julie he would one day come and smite the Freemasons from the face of France with his flaming sword. France would once again be governed according to the rule of government favorable to Christ and restore Catholicism, raising it to a new height of unprecedented glory on earth. However, heaven warned of terrible chastisements that were coming if the world did not convert, especially France, which would suffer first. Violent weather, pestilences, plagues, civil wars, the destruction of Paris, plus a new list of chastisements that seem to be predicted to Marie Julie for the first time. A period of two days of darkness that would fall before the famous chastisement foretold of the three days of darkness. A blood rain that would fall for seven weeks. Diseases that have never been seen before and will kill thousands in a rapid incubation period. However, heaven also gave her remedies in surprising detail to counteract the chastisements and protect the faithful. Of particular note is Our Lord's urgency during several of Marie Julie's ecstasies when the chastisements are described. I do not want my people to be surprised, that is, taken unawares. I want my people to be warned. We also know that these punishments and the great renewal are very close. We do not have centuries left, maybe not even decades. If you wish to continue and read her prophecies, remember, we are warned. The Great Tribulation This prophecy from Marie Julie Jeheny, dated July 7, 1880, foretells a grim future for the Church, specifically indicating that its leader, the Pope, would face great tribulation. The phrase, the Church will be deprived of its leader, likely refers to the time when Pope Leo III was pontiff. The prophecy suggests that the influence of Pope Leo XIII, particularly his reforms and teachings, would be diminished or erased. The imprint of his feet at the holy altar will be reduced to ashes by the flames of hell. Pope Leo XIII is notable for having had a famous vision in which Satan challenged our Lord, claiming that he could destroy the church if given sufficient time. According to tradition, our Lord granted Satan up to a century to attempt this. This vision profoundly influenced the Pope, leading him to compose the famous prayer to St. Michael the Archangel for the protection of the Church. 
He also instituted other prayers, such as the Three Hail Marys and the Salve Regina, to be said after every Mass for the Church's safeguarding. However, the prophecy suggests that these important prayers and other holy practices would be forgotten or eliminated, symbolized by the image of the Pope's imprint at the altar being reduced to ashes. Interestingly, these protective prayers were removed from the post-Mass liturgy following the reforms of Vatican II. This prophetic statement could be interpreted as a forewarning of the confusion that arose after Vatican II, including the misinterpretations of its reforms, which some argue have led to the weakening of the Church's spiritual defenses. St. Catherine Emmerich also prophesied that Satan would be unleashed on the Church some 40 to 60 years before the year 2000, a timeline that corresponds to significant changes within the Church and the world. The connection between her prophecy and the one of Marie Julie suggests that this time of Satan's influence could have been part of the larger spiritual battle foreseen by both mystics. Additionally, Pope Leo XIII's introduction of the minor exorcism prayer for the faithful and the major exorcism rite for priests were among the key tools he promoted to combat Satan's influence. However, the fact that these prayers are now rarely recited and that the major exorcism rite was revised in 1999 to the dissatisfaction of some exorcists aligns with the prediction that Satan would seek to alter all the rites in the church, water them down, or remove them entirely. The prophecy seems to suggest that this weakening of the church's traditional spiritual protections has allowed Satan a greater foothold, reflecting the spiritual and moral confusion that followed Vatican II and the modern era's challenges to the church. Warning about diseases. This prophecy describes a serious disease that will afflict humanity, presenting symptoms that modern medical science will be unable to alleviate. The malady is said to attack the heart first, followed by the mind, and finally the tongue. It will be accompanied by intense heat, causing unbearable redness and patches on the body. The disease will spread rapidly within the body or through the population, manifesting fully within seven days. Marie-Julie Jaheny's vision warns that the only remedy for this disease is the leaves of the hawthorn plant. She specifies that the leaves, not the wood, should be used. Even when dry, they will retain their effectiveness. The leaves should be boiled in water for 14 minutes with the container covered to preserve the steam, and the remedy must be taken three times a day as soon as symptoms appear. The prophecy further specifies that this disease will be especially severe in Brittany, where people will have drifted away from God, thus leaving them more vulnerable to the malady. Symptoms will include an intense reaction in the heart, possibly indicating high blood pressure or increased heart rate, and vomiting. If the remedy is taken too late, the affected parts of the body will turn black, with yellowish pale streaks running through the blackened areas, signaling the advanced stage of the disease. The disease as described is characterized by a rapid and severe progression, and the Hawthorne remedy is presented as the only cure. This warning appears to be a call for both spiritual and physical preparedness. Two Nights of Darkness The prophecy about the two nights of darkness as described by Marie-Julie Jehenny differs from the more well-known prophecy of the three days of darkness, but serves as a significant warning leading up to it. These two nights are portrayed as a foreshadowing of the divine punishment to come, marking God's initial descent in wrath upon the world. The prophecy foresees two days and two nights of darkness, distinct from the three days of final punishment. These two days will take place as an early warning from God and be marked by severe atmospheric phenomena, including a purple and red sky that will hang low, almost obscuring tall trees. The trees will burn and their sap will dry up, preventing them from producing fruit the following year. Rain during these days will carry a foul odor, like burning hailstones, and wherever it falls, it will pierce even the hardest surfaces, leaving behind visible burn marks. The earth will be covered by a black, frightening rain, 
but this will not harm food sources used by Christians. Although it will seem light in some areas, no one will be able to see clearly due to an obscuring hot flash sent as an envoy of God, which will blind those who try to look outside. At night, violent disturbances will occur, with cries heard in the air, and people will not be able to move about on earth, which will be covered with justice. Only blessed wax candles, pure beeswax, will provide light during the darkness. Candles mixed with other materials will not light, emphasizing the need for purity. During the day, candles may be extinguished unlike the three days of darkness, when they must remain lit at all times. The pure wax candles represent Christ as the light of the world and symbolize the purity of faith required during these times. Just as the Jews were required to have a spotless lamb for Passover, Christians will need pure candles to protect themselves spiritually during the coming darkness. The two nights of darkness will remind people of the coming three days of darkness and the need for spiritual preparation. These events will serve as a final wake-up call for humanity to repent and strengthen their faith before the ultimate divine judgment. The warnings about the two nights of darkness emphasize God's mercy in giving humanity a final chance to repent and prepare for the greater tribulation that will follow, the three days of darkness. The symbolism of pure wax candles ties into the theme of spiritual purity and faithfulness, reminding believers to adhere to the true faith and resist any corruptions or novelties introduced by Satan. In summary, the two nights of darkness are a precursor to greater punishments and serve as a call to repentance, vigilance, and preparation, both physically and spiritually, for the faithful. The need for blessed wax candles highlights the importance of maintaining spiritual purity amidst trials and tribulations. Attacks from the Devil and the Years of Persecution Marie-Julie also had to contend with the devil and his wiles from the time she first received the stigmata. Our Lady warned her in advance several times. One final warning came April 26, 1874. But Our Lady promised she would never abandon her in the midst of these new trials. Fifteen minutes after this warning, the devil tried to do his worst. He would beat Marie-Julie and cover her in bruises and cuts, which never grew infected and would quickly and miraculously heal with the holy water. He would destroy her sacramentals, break her rosaries, knock her holy pictures off the walls, throw her crucifix to the floor, plus knock blessed objects to the ground, or if he didn't destroy them or try to inflict some type on damage on them, he would spirit them away. Sometimes, if witnesses were present, he would try and push them over as well. Then, he would try other manifestations, appearing as a frightening beast, animals, or in his usual hideous shape. Threatening, he would eventually succeed in damning her soul, anything to try and force her to abandon her mission to save souls. When terror tactics failed, he changed strategy and would come as a tempting, beautiful young man, promising her everything from wealth to cures for her maladies, but without success. Other times he tried to fool her during her ecstasies by appearing as angels or saints. But Marie-Julie was extremely cautious about every apparition, testing them all to ensure they were from heaven and thereby exposing the hellish imposter by prudence when he did appear in this guileful manner. If a mystical visitor complied and made on act of love to the Sacred Heart, she knew the apparition was true. When it was Satan, he would suddenly fly off when she demanded this request. Sometimes she could easily see through the disguise. If the demon appeared as a saint, the halo would be missing its glorious rays of light, or the symbol of the cross would not be depicted correctly on his clothes or vestments, appearing bent or twisted. After this first period of trials caused by the devil, Saint Michael came and returned all the objects Satan had stolen from her, giving her a period of peace until January 1875, after which a new round of torment was to begin. Satan adopted new fearful strategies with his hellish appearances, coming in the form of priest, no doubt to fool her. He was an earthly human visitor like many she received, but she spotted the ruse when she noticed the priest was missing a cross on his stole. 
The devil tried to give her a host while disguised in this form, but she refused. We can only imagine with horror what he was truly trying to give her, for he would attempt to poison her on other occasions and force her to swallow stomach-turning objects. One time he tried to force her to eat grass, other times he shoved a file of poisoned blood into her mouth, then clamped it shut. She could only open her mouth after her spiritual director, Foctor David, said the rite of exorcism over her. There were times the devil tried to clamp her mouth shut and prevent her from receiving Holy Communion from Foctor David, but he would stand there patiently with the Blessed Sacrament before her mouth until the devil was forced to release her. These attacks were not without fruit, for they were additional means of sacrifice she could offer to save souls. However, there were times she could get rid of him by sprinkling holy water. Her ecstasies occurred on a regular basis, and as with other authentic cases of this supernatural state with other mystics, they showed the following phenomena. The natural reactions of her senses ceased, and she remained insensible to the point she would not make the least reaction when pricked with pins and needles or burned, or when bright lights were flashed in her eyes. Sometimes her body would miraculously levitate, and she could distinguish the difference between blessed and unblessed objects. She could tell when a consecrated or unconsecrated host was placed before her. If she discerned a sacramental placed before her was blessed, she venerated it by kissing it profoundly. If it was unblessed, she would refuse to venerate it or remain unresponsive. For example, during a passion ecstasy on October 18, 1877, she stopped her mystical enactment of the Way of the Cross and asked for a picture of St. Francis. A visiting priest had one in his breviary and handed it to her, but she remained motionless and didn't venerate it. Foctor David then knew the picture wasn't blessed, and they blessed it immediately after which she reverenced it profoundly, covering it with kisses. During the same ecstasy, visitors held a rosary before her, but she refused to kiss or venerate the sacramental, as was her custom. The visitor then recalled they had lost the original crucifix to the rosary and had replaced it with another, but didn't think to have the replacement blessed. The blessing was done immediately, and Marie Julie grew happy, kissing the crucifix and the beads repeatedly before resuming her suffering of the passion currently underway in that particular ecstasy. Sometimes she would give surprising information about a holy relic presented to her during an ecstasy that no one had previously known about. One astounding example. Without saying a word to her beforehand, a relic was held before her and she immediately confirmed what the owner had only suspected up to then. They truly had a fragment of the lance that opened our Lord's side, and furthermore, it still contained a piece of his heart. Apparently, the relic belonged to the Marquis de la Franquerie, which the family still possesses to this day. In addition to this marvelous phenomenon, she received countless visitors from heaven during her ecstasies, who gave her great consolation and imparted spiritual advice. Naturally, our Lord and Our Lady were constant companions, but she also saw the Eternal Father and the Holy Spirit who would come in the form of a dove or as a flaming tongue of fire. Also, the list of saints who came to her is astounding. Sometimes they gave her a biography of their lives, providing details that no one knew about, or they corrected some elements that biographers and chroniclers had mistaken or had become confused through the years. Unknown saints also visited her and gave an account of their lives. At one point she grew so familiar with Saint Joseph that she even began bantering and teasing him during one ecstasy dated April 1st, 1880, in order to have certain petitions granted until our Lord himself had to come and say, enough, rescuing his foster father from her persistent wheedling the holy saint who received stigmata. Marie Julie, the eldest of five children, was born on February 12, 1850 in Blen, close to La Frodaise in Brittany, France. Her parents, Charles and Marie Boya Jaheni, were pious, hardworking peasants. Little did they know, 
that their first child would be chosen by heaven for a special mission, to spread the love of the cross, to make sacrifices, and suffer for the salvation of sinners, to prepare the world for the prophesied chastisements, and to announce once again the coming of the great monarch and the angelic pontiff who would restore the glory of Christendom in an unprecedented and miraculous manner. Apparently, the first signal grace she received was at a very young age when she heard an interior voice while at church, Stay a little longer with me. From that time on, she was always drawn to the tabernacle where our Lord resided in the Blessed Sacrament and would spend long hours in prayer with our Lord, or she would withdraw to a quiet place just to be alone and meditate. However, to please her brother and sisters, she would play with them when they demanded it, and when she was old enough, she would help her mother with the housework. One can only imagine how joyous a day it was for her when she could receive Holy Communion for the first time. In those days, First Communion was not given to children. When she was older, desiring to grow in spiritual perfection, she eventually entered the Third Order of St. Francis. She was described as a model for the parish, always punctual for service, very modest, and is said to have approached the altar with the devotion of an angel when receiving Holy Communion. It was not until 1873 that she received the stigmata. On February 22, 1873, she grew seriously ill. The Blessed Mother appeared to her with the news that she would have much to suffer. Obviously, Marie Julie had made a complete offering of herself to God, and he had accepted her. On March 15, Our Lady appeared again and asked if she would be willing to suffer the same agonies her son had endured to save mankind, and Marie Julie affirmed that she was willing. Our Lady then replied that she would be given the five wounds, and the stigmata began on the 21st of March. Heaven was just beginning to send her the wounds of Christ. The crown of thorns appeared on October 5th. The wound in the left shoulder, where Christ carried the cross, was received on November the 25th. On December 6th, the scourge wounds appeared on her back, and on January 12th, 1874, she received wrist wounds, representing where the hands of our Lord were bound. She also received on the same day as the wrist wounds, a wound over her heart. On January the 14th, Additional scourge stigmata appeared on her ankles, legs, and forearms, and days later she received two scourge stripes on her side. Apparently, the local church authority, Monseigneur Fournier, Bishop of Nantes, did not waste a moment in setting up an investigation to verify the authenticity of these miracles. Dr. Imbert Gourbert, professor at the Faculty of Medicine at Clermont-Ferrand, was called to examine the appearance of the stigmata and to ascertain if this was the effect of hysteria or was indeed of an inexplicable, divine origin. When he asked Marie Julie what she saw when she received the stigmata, she replied, When I received the stigmata, our Lord appeared to me with radiant wounds. It was as if a sun surrounded them. A luminous ray came out of each wound and struck my hands, feet, and side. At the end of each ray, there was a drop of red blood, the ray that left the side of our Lord was twice as wide as the others and was shaped like a lance. The pain I felt was great, but it lasted barely one second. On February 20th, Our Lady announced to Marie Julie that she was to become the spiritual bride of Christ. A wound appeared around the ring finger of her right hand, a special mark showing that she had been chosen as the spiritual spouse of Christ. Immediately, her spiritual director, Father David, wrote to Dr. Imber Gorbert to inform him what had happened. Finally, she received one special stigmata, which apparently seems to be the first of its kind in the history of approved stigmatists. For well over a month, Marie Julie foretold she would receive a special mark on her chest and then revealed the date a week before it happened. On December 7th, Family and witnesses present were stunned to see a cross and flower appear on her chest with the words, O Crux Ave, Hail to the Cross, accompanied by the most extraordinary perfumes emanating from her body. When the ecstasy was over, 
the sign remained for the witnesses to examine. The stigmata bled every Friday, then later, only on Good Fridays, but the pain of the wounds always increased, especially on Fridays. On some occasions, the wounds were miraculously transformed on dates that were announced beforehand. For instance, on one date years later, May 1883, the family could hear the singing of angels. On All Saints, 1884, our Lord announced he would envelop her in a coat of bright light. At midnight on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, December 8th, our Lord fulfilled his promise and her family saw a stream of light about the size of a pea emanate from the wounds in her hands, which lasted for 10 minutes. It did not take long to arrive at a conclusion when the examinations began. Dr. Imbert Gorbert wrote to the bishop, declaring that he possessed a young woman with a genuine stigmata, that there was no fraud at La Fraude. The bishop Monseigneur Fournier also agreed, for he wrote to the doctor on June 6, 1875. The reports that I receive daily on Marie Julie show me more and more the action of God on this soul. He grants her graces of an obvious supernatural order. At the same time, she grows in virtue and noble sentiments. The natural and human disappear in her, and she often speaks to people she sees or who are referred to her, giving instructions which are not in keeping with her normal state. Therefore, be confident, dear doctor, the time will come when Marie Julie herself will be the proof. She is sincere. What she manifests is supernatural. I see nothing but good, edifying, and in conformity with the principles of spirituality. Therefore, it is God who favors her. You may be sure it will turn out well. During her ecstasies, Marie Julie received an astonishing number of heavenly visitors and was foretold events that were to come until the time of her death in February of 1941. She discovered she had been granted more than one guardian angel and received many of the early saints of the church who told her details about their missions and martyrdoms. Sometimes they revealed special devotions to her, gave her spiritual direction, but most importantly, our Lord and Our Lady were constant visitors, granting her heavenly consolations in the midst of her sufferings, also warning the church, France, and the world through her about the bleak time of punishments that awaited the earth if they refused to convert and submit to his will. Apart from predicting the miraculous occurrences that were happening in her own life, she foresaw historical events. On September 15, 1879, she predicted Bismarck's Kulturkampf. On September 15, 1881, she announced in detail the death of Melanie Calvat, seer of La Salette, which occurred on December 15, 1904. She predicted the catastrophic eruption of Montpellier in Martinique and then described the horrific scene as it was taking place. In 1881, she foresaw the Transvaal War, announcing it would take place at the death of Queen Victoria, which happened in 1901. On the death of Pope Leo III, and a few days before the opening of the conclave, she announced his successor. The Adriatic Cardinal is chosen by God. His reign will be that of Christ. He will not last very long and will be called pious. She foretold the French would lose the colony of Algeria in a war to the Arabs and that the priests of that country would suffer terrible trials. She also predicted World War I and World War II, 